everyone. How are you doing? Cool. I'm Gareth Jenkins. Uh, I'm founder of Deckbound, uh, which I started in 2014. I've been working in blockchain games since uh, 2013. Uh, I wrote a protocol called Bitbind, which was uh, one of the first things that was around to do uh, compound ownership on, on Bitcoin, actually, at the time. Uh, we use that to represent assets in games, in Deckbound, and in various other things. Uh, that's moved on, and I'll talk. I'll reference that later. But I'm here to talk about player ownership. Uh, this was originally a talk that was pitched at a mainstream gaming audience um, or a mainstream games developer audience. But actually, I think it fits quite well here because there's some things we can talk about around defining what player ownership is uh, and some of the the terms that we use in the in the blockchain game space that I think is is worth just going over. So I'm going to spend some time doing that. Um, for those of you who were in Helsinki a few weeks ago, these first couple of slides are a repetition of uh, the ownership aspects of that talk, but I think they're really important. And then I'm going to get into some, uh, some examples of what people think player ownership is in the game space, what players think it is. I'm going to talk about blockchain tech, um, and then I'm going to try and bring that together and, and describe how I think we're fixing things and, and the, the various different bits that relate to that. So first up, players think that they own their stuff. This is pretty common. I think we all understand this. People in, who play games, they have this understanding of the things in their games as things that they own, uh, whether that's the games themselves or the items in the games. But they don't. We know that they don't own those those things, and the games industry has gone out of its way to to really sort of prevent people from accessing things in a way that represents uh, something that they they might own. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is the games industry treats games as games, and that this is something that really hasn't changed despite the move towards games as services and various other changes that have happened in the games industry. Games are still treated as these kind of siloed things, um, but I fundamentally disagree with that. I think games are, are data and services and items and culture and social structures and all of these other things. Uh, but. Curiously, and this is something that I started with uh, years ago when I got into this, um, blockchain actually sort of quite accurately reflects how people think about item ownership in games. Uh, players think about these things that they have, either they acquired them or they earned them or they created them, um, and they think of them as theirs, that they should be able to do whatever they want with them. They often can't, but they'd like to. And actually, that mirrors quite accurately how the blockchain works, right? We, we create these things. Uh, people have outputs of transactions or data in smart contracts. They can't necessarily duplicate those things or copy them, uh, but they, they own them and they control them. Um, and that player understanding of, of ownership, I think, maps really well to what we're doing with blockchain. I think it's why games is one of the most obvious uh, applications of blockchain tech. Uh, and then I think this is a point worth making as well. Players already care about their things. We, we're not trying to, well, at least I'm not trying to fix anything with games. I think games are awesome. Um, but we we get confused, I think, when we're talking about this stuff. And it came up yesterday when uh, I think a few people mentioned scarcity. It's not something that you create. It's a product of something else. We don't actually have to fix these problems for gamers. But they already care about the things that they have. There's not actually a problem there to solve. So what, what is it that we're doing with the technology and, and why? So let's have a look at that. Um, I've just got three examples up here uh, from the games industry, which I think are quite good. Uh, and they're pretty, uh, pretty workable examples. There's, there are obviously others, but these are good. So I want to play the game that I bought because I own it. Uh, the example I've got up here is, is GOG.com. If you're not familiar with that, it's a, a service run by CD Projekt Red, who make The Witcher and various other things. Uh, that um, gives access to older games and newer games as well now, actually. But they put a lot of effort into um, making games available to players, dealing with licensing issues, technology issues, and those kinds of things. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's an interesting service. It exists because they cared about providing access. And it's now seen as a you know, pretty major storefront in its own right. But players like this because they get access to things in a way that they can use them without restrictions in regards to DRM and other things like that which you often don't get elsewhere. Uh, so the next thing is uh, the, the concept of making a thing in a game. So players, when they, when they make things in games, they believe that they own them. The, the example I've thrown up here is a Diablo character, a hardcore character. Um, players don't really do anything that's related to ownership with that character, but because they made it, they describe it as, as theirs. They believe that it's theirs. And this is a pretty broad category of things. It applies to lots of different games where players create things and therefore believe that they're theirs. Um, and then finally, uh, 
when you can do things with an object in a game that are like what you would do with the thing that you own, people tend to think that they own them. So if you can sell, trade, use, or destroy an item, people tend to believe that it's theirs. And this example is from Eve, um, and I'm going to come back to this later a few times, I think. Um, Eve is a game where players uh, believe that they own things, and CCP treat players as if they own the things. And it, I think it's a great example for some of this stuff. So what does this get us to in terms of blockchain? Th these are just three different examples of ownership. Um, the blockchain space, we're doing a whole bunch of different things. And I want to talk about those because I want to try and relate what we're doing in blockchain games and blockchain technology back to some of these player ownership issues that exist in the video game industry. So let's go over the, these uh, four categories. So decentralized games. This one's relatively easy to relate to the player ownership stuff because it actually doesn't really. Uh, this concept of decentralized games um, hasn't really been properly defined yet. Um, I'm glad Daniel talked about it yesterday and a few others did as well. Um, most of what we're doing isn't really decentralized games and the, the concept of an actually decentralized game I don't think has really been well defined. In my view, for a game to really be decentralized, it has to be designed in a decentralized manner. That doesn't solve any of the existing problems with player ownership. It probably gives us some really cool stuff and I'm very excited about that but it doesn't relate to, uh, to player ownership directly. Uh, we've got games that use blockchain tech. and I'll come back onto this and expand these out shortly, but that could be a game that uses blockchain tech for payments, for ownership, uh, for infrastructure and services. And I think we're all you know, working on things that can do that. Uh, crypto blank, uh, games that are just leveraging the success of cryptocurrencies, crypto kitties, and so on. Uh, crypto kitties I wouldn't actually put in this category, but unfortunately, that's the easiest way of describing it. Um, they're really just things that are uh, not, not really trying to do anything innov innovative with the tech or even with games. They're just, they're just trying to piggyback off the success of other things. Uh, and then finally, we've got this blockchain games category. Um, and uh, this is the thing that I'm most excited about. This is games that exist because of the blockchain. Not just games where we use blockchain technology to solve problems, but games that couldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and I don't have a lot of time, so obviously the example I'm going to give is of the game I'm working on, um, which is Lunar Mines. Um, Lunar Mines is a game where players build mines in space and they uh, connect these mines together to build relays and they send probes out to space to discover new star systems. And when they discover those new star systems, they take ownership of the mining rights of those moons and they build more and so on and so forth. Um, it's got a combination of minimalist city building, there's crafting in the relay system, space exploration and navigation and all these cool things. And uh, as you build up this kind of empire of, of assets in space, uh, you then have to like, do things like maintenance and control your probes and deal with all of these issues. And that's hard work. So the game has a contracting system in it where players can contract with each other anonymously to provide services. But that contracting system is based on actual crypto payments, real world transfers of money. Um, and that's something that couldn't have been done without blockchain technology uh, for legal, commercial, and technical reasons. That wouldn't have been possible. Uh, and this game is facilitated directly by being able to do those things. Uh, it runs on the Delox blockchain, which is something we created uh, for ownership. Uh, and it uses Ethereum for payments. And we, we bridge those two things together, and players can transact directly and do all these cool things. Um, it's a blockchain game. It's something that wouldn't have existed without blockchain or blockchain technologies. Um, and its design is informed directly by the fact that we were able to solve those problems. So let's just jump back a minute. Let's have a look at those three categories that I talked about. Um, and I just want to point out some of the problems here. Now, what I've done is I've picked examples for each of these that are existing examples in the in games industry of people doing things that are actually pretty decent. Um, and I felt it was easier to take the good examples and work back from their problems than it was to take the bad ones. It's quite easy to pull apart some of the, the poorer behavior in the, in the video games industry related to these. But let's just quickly go through them. Um, GOG.com, it's great, but it's kind of fundamentally flawed. A lot of the time, people are buying rights to games that they have already previously purchased. Um, they generally don't mind doing that because they want access to them, and they're often a lot cheaper than they would have been originally. But still, it's kind of got this fundamental flaw. Um, and ultimately, it's probably not that maintainable. Um, CD Projekt Red put a huge amount of effort into making games available on the service. And with newer games, it gets harder because if they have an online or connected component, it's often difficult for them to work with that and provide any kind of ongoing guarantees of those things being able to work. Uh, in the second category, the things that you own, well, this is a really complicated one, actually. Not complicated from a technology point of view, but complicated from a design point of view. Players 
care about the things in their games because the things in their games were set up for them to care about them. And uh, I think Blizzard are a, a studio who've kind of given us many examples of, of how this can work well. Um, they tend to create content that players will ultimately attach themselves to. They're very good at that. Um, but if you're not Blizzard, it's quite hard to convince people that your new IP or your new thing in your new game is, is worth them being interested in. They don't know whether it's going to have that depth. They don't know whether it's going to be something that will be there for them in the long term. And I don't mean exist technologically. I just mean whether or not there is a, a sufficient curve of content and uh, introduction of content that allows them to engage with that game. Likewise with EVE, if you're not CCP, good luck convincing people that they own the things in, in your game. Uh, EVE is the kind of weird byproduct of the industry. It's awesome, it's very exciting, but it's not something that can be recreated. Um, funnily enough, a few years ago when I was working on the early stages of Deckbound, I listened to Hilmar give a talk in Newcastle, talking about it uh, last night with him. It was, he gave this story about uh, his, his newborn child. He'd taken some time off uh, not long uh, into the launch of EVE. Uh, and he was playing with a bunch of other players. They didn't know who he was, and he developed some friendships with them. And uh, because he was looking after his newborn child, he got distracted and unfortunately lost one of his friend's ships and uh, had the moral dilemma of whether or not he should log into the database and recreate it and ultimately decided not to. But it's that kind of behavior that has come through from CCP over and over again and has led to this, this kind of odd situation where we have this game that really does exhibit all of these things that we talk about in ownership, despite the fact that it doesn't technologically have that or legally have that. Um, I don't think we can recreate that. I think we need tools and platforms to allow us to say to players, no, actually, you do really own these things and you can do what you want with them. OK, so let's bring this back to our little matrix of of blockchain game things. Well, we've got decentralized games. As I've said, I don't think we're really there yet. We don't know what they are. Uh, personally, I think that decentralized games uh, are a product of decentralized design, which I don't know what to cite as, a, as an example of what that is. It's quite complicated. I like the idea of decentralized tech being able to run games in the long term. But largely, decentralized games are those that aren't centrally cr controlled, and I would say not centrally created. Uh, games that use blockchain tech, this is just games. This could be anything. Uh, literally any video game could use blockchain technology to do any number of different things. And I think we've, there's been plenty of talks about that, and I'm sure there'll be more today about all these cool different things that games can use uh, for, with the technologies that we've created. Uh, crypto blank, well, this is just, I don't really care about this category at all. It's not games. It's just people piggybacking off of success of other things. So let's ignore that. And uh, blockchain games, well, I think that's kind of broadly what we're all doing. There are examples of people who are working in the space who are concentrating on the blockchain tech part, not the, not the blockchain games bit. But broadly, most of the games in the space are being facilitated by what we're doing with the technology. And I think we need better examples. We need to do more. We're all working on these exciting projects. And it's awesome that hopefully a year from now, three years from now, we'll have all of these wonderful, rich examples. But I think basically that's what we're talking about. So let's move through these and just uh, relate this back to where we were when we started. Um, I'm going to move those two off, off of the left there. The decentralized games I don't think is relevant to solving existing player ownership issues uh, and the, the crypto games I don't really care about. So uh, games that use blockchain tech, well, let's re relate that back quickly to those starting examples. GOG.com, um, that could be facilitated uh, by having rights and ownership exist on the blockchain, and there are people who are working on that. It's not the most exciting or sexy problem to work on, uh, and it is actually quite difficult, um, but I think eventually people will solve that. Um, the Diablo example, uh, items in games that players should care about, is an interesting one because we don't actually really need to do much. We're not trying to change how the design of those types of games work if we give people Ownership, ownership manifest on a blockchain in games like Diablo, then players will probably think that's pretty cool. We don't actually necessarily have to change anything. And then down in the bottom category, uh, we've got blockchain games. Obviously, I've got Lunar Mines up there. That's what I'm working on. Uh, and it's definitely an example of a game that exists because of the blockchain. Hunter Coin there as well, which was the, basically the first blockchain game thing in the space. Again, something that was facilitated solely by the blockchain. And EVE kind of gets an honorary mention because although it's not actually a blockchain game, it's probably the best example we have of what we're looking to build. And I think all of us here would be happy to create something, uh, something like that. Uh, and finally, I'll stick this guy up there as well. Uh, CryptoKitties is a blockchain game. And it's quite interesting because if you take CryptoKitties and remove the blockchain component, I think you end up with something different. 
um, players interact with that game in a fashion that is because of the limitations. So the, the fees aspect and performance problems on the network actually influence how people engage with it. And I don't think they would engage with that if it wasn't for the fact that it was based on the blockchain. So therefore, it's a blockchain game. So that's it. Uh, that's kind of my sort of summary of where I think we're at with player ownership in relation to what we're working on. Um, obviously, there's other bits that sit outside of this in the, uh, in the decentralized bit and some other areas that don't really address player ownership, existing player ownership issues in the games industry. That's interesting, but I think it's worth when we're talking to people about fixing player ownership and solving problems in the games industry, I think it's important that we're clear about what problems we're solving and what it is that we're building. Are we talking about adding blockchain technology to games or are we actually building something new as a product of all of that? So thanks very much. I'm Gareth Jenkins. Um, if you want to find out more about me, uh, lunarminds.io, where you won't actually find out anything, but you can put your email address in and we'll tell you more later in the year when we go live with all that stuff. Uh, and Delox uh, is the blockchain that I've created that uh, doesn't have a currency or token attached to it that is just for player ownership and, and assets. Uh, it's based on Bitbind. Uh, so if you're familiar with my older work on Bitbind, it's kind of the home of Bitbind version 2. Uh, if you've got questions, you can email me at gareth.deckbound.com, and I'll be around all day. So give me a shout. Thanks very much.